And now it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Mike Vincent. Hello, Michael Vincent here, and today we're taking a look at the Hunt for Gollum adventure pack uh, to go with the Shadows of Mirkwood cycle. So this is the first of six adventure packs. Um, we've spent the last couple of weeks looking at the core set and the four different spheres and what player cards they had to offer. So I'm very excited to jump in and finally start looking at some of the uh, expansions for the Lord of the Rings Living Card Game. So today we're going to take a look at Hunt for Gollum and let's jump in by seeing who our first new hero is. All right, so here we see a very familiar face to anyone who's read the books or watched the movies, uh, Bilbo Baggins. He has a starting threat of nine. He has one willpower and one attack two defense, and two hit points. He, of course, is a hobbit. Uh, he is a lore hero, and his text reads, the first player draws one additional card in the resource phase. So here we see a hero who's somewhat similar to a lore hero we looked at last time, and that is Barovor. So maybe I'll bring her up here just so we can do a bit of a comparison. So the main mechanic for both Barovor and Bilbo Baggins is card draw. Um, both have strengths and weaknesses in this regard. Um, we see for Barovor, you need to exhaust her in order to get her ability, whereas Bilbo, you don't, so that is a big advantage. Uh, but with Barovor, you do get to draw two cards, and with Bilbo, it's just one. It's worth keeping in mind as well with Bilbo that it's one additional card to the first player. So this means that both you and your partner can benefit from this ability. Um, Stats-wise, there's no doubt that Barovor is better. Um, yes, she has one extra threat point, but she also has an extra attack, an extra willpower, and two extra hit points. So overall, Barovor is probably stronger, but there are some benefits to Hobbit, uh, sorry, to Bilbo's ability in that you get to draw um, one card without having to exhaust him, which is nice. Now, of course, if you're thinking of playing a Hobbit deck, then Bilbo Baggins will certainly make sense. And I think Bilbo, his defense is good at two defense, but it's very scary given that he only has two hit points. Um, so if you do decide to block with him, if you draw the wrong shadow card, it could result in a dead hobbit. So fortunately, if you decide to pick up the Dark Riders expansion though, we've seen there's a lot more cards um, for making hobbits better and expanding hobbits. So um, Hobbit Cloak comes to mind, something to boost some defense, or if you're using Bill the Pony, uh, that would give him some extra hit points. So I think Bilbo Baggins, though not too inspiring when you first see his stats, um, does become a bit more powerful with the newer um, Hobbit cards from the Black Riders expansion taken into consideration. Um, now, it's worth mentioning too that if you're looking for a Hobbit deck and you would like to include some more lore or have a primary lore focus, this allows you to have two um, Hobbits. So now you can have Pippin from the Black Riders expansion and you can have Bilbo as well. So now you have two lore Hobbit heroes to choose from. So in the context of when he comes out or if you only have the core set, um, Bilbo Baggins has some upside, but also because his stats are so low and his hit points are so low, is a bit of a risky hero. Um, if you draw the wrong treachery card or win revealed effect that will do direct damage, um, then he may not, might not last very long. But he is a solid hero. I think he gains more utility as um, we've seen more Hobbit cards develop, and he might be a good consideration if you're thinking of playing a Hobbit deck. So there you have Bilbo Baggins. So while we're looking at lore cards, we might as well stick with that theme. And here we see the Rivendell Minstrel. She is an ally, she has a cost of three, and she has two willpower, zero attack, zero defense, and one hit point. She is also a Noldor, and her response reads, after you've played the Rivendell Minstrel from your hand, search your deck for one song card and add it to your hand, then shuffle your deck. So the Rivendell Minstrel, um, I think, is a very specialized card that you would only want to use in a particular deck. Um, now, we haven't been able to see the neutral cards yet. We will be looking at one with this video. But the first set of songs that we see basically allow you to give heroes multiple um, spheres. So this will allow certain heroes to pay for resources from a sphere they don't belong to. Which means if you're playing a multi-sphere deck, maybe a dual or tri-sphere, then I could see why you would want songs um, to have into your hand so that you can play them out and make it easier to buy allies, events, and attachments for the different spheres. So she's useful in that way, but other than that, 
doesn't have a whole lot to offer. Um, once she's out on the table and you get your song, of course you'll probably be questing with her with a willpower of two, but she is a bit expensive at a cost of three. She won't be able to attack and she is very fragile with zero defense and one hit point. So even if you're not blocking with her or using her as a chump blocker, it's possible that if you draw the wrong treachery card or when revealed effect, that one damage would kill her off. So I would only say the Rivendell Minstrel would be worth bringing along if there was, if you really needed songs to make your deck work. And certainly this is the case sometimes. So in very particular situations, if you really need to get that song so that you can afford um, to pay for other cards if you're playing a multi-sphere deck, then I think the Rivendell Minstrel is worth considering. But otherwise, she is not um, an ally I would be looking to bring on a regular basis. So the other lore card that we get with the Hunt for Golem expansion is Strider's Path. It is an event, it has a cost of one, and reads response. After a location is revealed from the encounter deck, immediately travel to that location without resolving its travel effects. If another location is currently active, return it to the staging area. So this is a card, again, that would be good in the right situation. If you know you're going to be playing against an encounter where there's a few really brutal travel effects for some of the locations and you have to travel there, or you know they're going to have a high threat, then Strider's Path could certainly be worth considering. Um, being able to negate some of those brutal travel effects could be handy. Uh, the other utility you can get from this card is if there is an active location that has really nasty effects, um, perhaps you have to start with it or you need to get through it at the beginning, but let's say you need to step back and take some more time, well, this would allow you to remove that from the active location and replace it um, with another one. So if you need to get rid of a, an active location and put it back in the staging area for a while, or if there's just some really brutal travel effects that you don't want to have to worry about, then I could see including Strider's Path. So again, this is a card that against the right encounter deck I think is worth considering, but is not a card I would include uh, in a regular deck or lore deck. Okay, so moving on to Spirit, we have another ally, and this is the Westfold Horsebreaker. Uh, he has a cost of two, has one willpower, zero attack, one defense, and one hit point. He also has the keyword Rohan and reads action, discard Westfold Horsebreaker to choose and ready a hero. Um, so I'm not too big on the Westfold Horsebreaker. Uh, I've included him in decks before. Um, I have used his ability, but I do find for a cost of two, it's kind of a bummer to have to discard him and then be rid of him for the rest of the game. He's not very good at, at questing with only one willpower. Um, he could serve as a chump blocker, but again, if you're using him as a chump blocker, it means you're not able to use his ability. So really, the only reason you're probably going to want to include the Westfold Horsebreaker is if you want to ready a hero. Now, to me, um, some, a card like Unexpected Courage does a much better job of this, um, and I think that would be a more worthy card to include. It is worth mentioning that he does have the Rohan trait. And if you are playing a Rohan deck um, and you have some cards that synergize well with it, then he may be worth in considering for that reason. But otherwise, um, this is not a card that I like very much. I see that it could come in handy in the right situation. Um, but the fact that you have to discard him, yes, there's ways to get him back into your hand. But again, at a cost of two, I feel like his stats and ability aren't quite worth it. So, But given that the new expansions are starting to move through the movies, uh, once we get to the two towers, uh, once we start seeing um, more Rohan, I I'm assuming this is a keyword that will be built up even more over time. So there may be more cards that will synergize and make the Westfold Horsebreaker um, a better card to include in the future. Okay, so here we have an event. It is Mustering the Rohirrim. It has a cost of one and reads action. Search the top 10 cards of your deck for any one Rohan ally card and add it to your hand. Then shuffle uh, the other cards back into your deck. So this is a card that I do think is good. Um, it has a cost of one, which means it's relatively cheap. And being able to search the top 10 cards of your deck is pretty good. Um, you'll see there's another card we'll look at in a little bit, which will allow you to look at the top five. But the top 10 cards is going to give you a pretty good sampling of your deck. And if you are playing a Rohan deck, then there's a very good chance you will run into an ally that you can use for this purpose. Now, it does only allow you to put one ally card into your hand. Um, but as we see uh, in future expansions, there will be some really good um, Rohan allies that come out. And so this card will be very handy. If all you have is the core set and this one expansion, this card won't have much usefulness to you just because there aren't enough Rohan allies to probably justify making um, a Rohan deck at this point. But if you have a lot of the cards or you're planning to buy more expansions um, and the Rohan 
keyword is something that you're interested in, if you want to make a pretty cool um, Rohan deck, then this card would be almost, I would think, a must include as it'll allow you to go through and take out some of your better allies. So yeah, I think at this point, if all you have is the core set, maybe not worth it at this point, but if you're planning to get more cards or you have more cards um, and you want a Rohan deck, then this is a great card. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>